Big Crow. Well, first of all, I want to thank <coughs> Julie Davis for inviting me back for the uh, a second time. And any of you who know Julie, she is an extremely dedicated uh, person to teaching young people and teaching them history. And uh, there's a lot of Julie Davises across the country. Uh, and, and most of them are at junior colleges. The best education that you can get is at a junior college. So consider yourself to be, <laughs> consider yourself to be very fortunate. And I, I want to thank all of you for coming out uh, to hear, you know, to hear what I want to share and to sh hear about the part of history that I want to talk about. Because history is so important. It's so important. And each of us's history is so important. The history of our family, the history of our ancestors, the history of where we came from. Because there's a lot of pain in, in the history that all of us have from our ancestors and our family. And it's important for you to find out that history. Because that history will help to push you forward. It will help you to propel you forward. Because we have a problem in our society today where there's such a tremendous gap between where we are now and to our own personal ancestral histories. We are not connected to that history. And, uh, and I grew up in a time period where we were very much connected to our history. Uh, and we very much were connected to our grandparents and our parents. You know, I grew up in, in the time period where we had a cultural value system and, and we had uh, the oral tradition. You know, the oral tradition is when the ancestors and the elders would constantly tell you about the family history and about the history of the community and the history of the people. And they did that for a reason. They did that for a purpose because they wanted the young people to take their place, to keep things moving forward to work forward for the benefit of the family, to work forward for the benefit of the community, and to work forward for the betterment of, 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 of the nation, uh, whatever that nation might have looked like and whatever that nation might have been. You know, and, and, and I, I live in New Mexico now where, uh, uh, where the, the Pueblo Indians are the most traditional uh, tribes in America, and that is something to uh, a beauty to see how they prepare their young people and, and, and how they use those old traditions to connect young people uh, to the past. Because the past is what is going to push us forward. A lot of people say we need to forget the past, but no, we don't need to forget the past. We need to spend some time in looking at the past, as painful as it may be, and then use that uh, to move forward. Now, the, the, uh, the other part of the cultural value system that we have, besides the oral tradition, being constantly told stories, and is, is that the, 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 uh, the cultural value system that we had was that, uh, that the elders were the most respected element in the community. And I just remember growing up being engulfed in that and having uh, tremendous respect for my grandparents and tremendous respect for my aunts and my uncles and, 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 and listening to the things that they had to say. And so the elders were the most important element. We don't have that today. You know, elders are not respected. It, it just blows me away that we can exist in a society where the elders are not respected. Uh, the other part of that culture value system is that young people, young people belong to everybody. You know, they don't just belong to the mother and the father. Uh, uh, Khalil Cabron says that they belong to everyone. And, 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 uh, and that's, that's what I grew up in a time period where the, where the children, the young people in the community were, were, were part of everybody. Everybody had a responsibility for raising and teaching and protecting the young people. And so we've lost our cultural value system here in this country. We don't even have a cultural value system here in this country. We don't have a culture. It, but we have a type of culture now. It's a culture. It's, it's a predatory, super predatory culture that we have in this country. 
where nothing is respected, where nothing is sacred. How can you have a culture where nothing is sacred, where nothing is respected, where there's certain things you just don't go beyond? And that's the type of culture that we have now. That's why we have two and a half million people in prison. What kind of country has two and a half million people in prison? What kind of country, the wealthiest country in the world, we have 50,000 homeless people here in LA in the shadow of Hollywood. How could we have the largest, the second largest homeless encampment here in, uh, in the United States in the shadow of all the wealth of Hollywood? That doesn't make sense. How could we have 20,000 homeless young people in New York City, the largest, richest uh, city in the world? 20,000 homeless young people. You know, how can we have an educational system that is so uneven that, <coughs> that you know, people of color, poor white people, get the lowest education? And the people who have the money, the people who can afford to, the people who live in the best neighborhoods, they get the highest level of education. That's why they end up at Harvard. That's why they end up at Yale. That's why they end up at all the best colleges. When everybody, everybody should have that opportunity. Everybody should have that opportunity to get a high level of education. I was a single parent myself for a while, and I just remembered the struggle that I had to go through to make sure that my kids got a good education. And it was a lot of work. It was a lot of, at, at some one point, I had to homeschool one of my daughters because she just wasn't getting the right type of education. And so I had to uh, uh, clean floors, I had to be a janitor, and I, I put her in a private school that I could not afford to pay for. And so they allowed me to be a janitor three days a week. And that's what I had to do to make sure that she got a good education. So getting back to history, you know, I came up in a time of history when, um, I gotta keep tabs on my time, when we were very much connected to history. I remember growing up in a house with my great-great-grandmother. <clears throat> and I remember, um, uh, you know, she was born in 1867 and her mother was a slave. And, and her, her mother's name was Mariah, a little black bow-legged slave woman. And so that really connected me to slavery. You know, when I was growing up, I had people that I went to school with, people that I worked with who came from the deep south. And they actually had to drop out of school to work in the cotton fields. We're talking about in the, in the 1950s and 1960s. They had to drop out of school to work in the, in the cotton fields. So we were very much connected to that part of our history. And it was part of that history that helped us to push us forward and propel us forward and gave us a sense of purpose. Because you gotta have a sense of purpose. You know, when you come into this world, everybody has a purpose, everybody has something to do. And it's not necessarily for your own self gratification. I mean, it's, it's, it's important to, uh, you know, work for goals and work to want to be a, doctor and a lawyer and a, and a pharmacist and a business person, those, those are great things. But you are also have to always remember that you are connected to the rest of, 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 of society, that you are connected to your children and you are connected to your grandchildren, that you really do have a, a, a purpose to serve here to make this world a better place. And that's kind of the way that we grew up. You know, growing up, for me, growing up in the 50s and 60s. And, and you know, every time that the, the television came on, we know we were gonna see a black person on TV because the civil rights movement was unfolding at that time. And we were gonna see Martin Luther King, we were gonna see Medgar Evers, we were gonna see uh, all these demonstrators, these, these black demonstrators and, and, and a lot of white young people who came down to the South to participate in the civil rights movement. We were gonna see this great movement unfolding before our very eyes on TV. You know, we're gonna see uh, uh, Bull Connor coming out <clears throat> and saying that we're gonna put these niggers in their place. You know, we're gonna see the hoses being sprayed upon these little young kids as they were demonstrating and protesting against segregation. 
You know, we were going to see Martin Luther King. We were going to see Medgar Evers. And, um, and so this was like, kind of like an education, education for us. This was uh, for us a, a really kind of a, a preview of, of what the world was really about and what our role was going to be in the world. Now, I grew up in, in, in a time period in the 60s where there were so many political assassinations. Political assassinations. One of the first ones that I remember was the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the first Irish Catholic president elected to be president of the United States. And he came from a family, the Kennedy family, that had their own money, they had their own wealth, so they weren't connected to the other wealthy families and political entities in America at that time. And so John F. Kennedy took some very different positions from what the military industrial complex wanted him to take. You know, the first being the Vietnam War. You know, uh, there were, uh, when he became president, there were military advisors in Vietnam. And the military, uh, U.S. military generals were pushing for an expansion of the war. They were pressing Kennedy to start a war against the North Vietnamese people. And Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh, you know, they labeled him as a communist. And when Ho Chi Minh started the movement in North Vietnam, he wanted to unify his country because it had been occupied by European, particularly the French, uh, uh, for, for hundreds of years. And he wanted to unify that country. And when he began, first began his movement, he came to the U.S. for support. And the U.S. told him no. So he turned to the Soviets uh, for, for military support. And so he became labeled as a communist. He really wasn't a communist. You know, he was just trying to create his country. And so Kennedy recognized that this was a horrible thing for America to get involved in. And so he refused to do that. The next thing was Cuba, what happened in Cuba. You know, Cuba was a playground for the wealthy Americans. You know, the wealthy Americans went to Cuba and used it as their whore, whore house. you know. They used the Cuban women, they used the Cuban boys uh, for sex, they exploited the resources from the Cuban people. And so Fidel Castro and, and Che Guevara, they created this movement and they went into uh, uh, Havana, marched into Havana and, and kicked Batista out the puppet that the U.S. had put in there. And Castro really wasn't a communist. He had no real design. To Castro was a baseball player. You know, he wanted to play baseball. And, but uh, the U.S. turned their back on him. And so he had no choice but to turn to the Soviets for support. And so it became labeled as a communist nation. And so uh, the CIA wanted to put pressure on John F. Kennedy to invade Cuba, and, and John F. Kennedy said no, he wasn't going to do it. And so they had the Bay of Pigs debacle, they wanted John F. Kennedy to send in jets after the, the, the Bay of Pigs happened and, and the Cuban people, uh, the, the Cuban exile, people who were in exile were defeated by the Cuban people, and John F. Kennedy said no, I'm not going to do that. And because of that, John F. Kennedy was slated for assassination, and he was killed in a most brutal way. Now the other thing that John F. Kennedy, his significance to the black community was that him and his brother supported the civil rights movement that was taking place in the South. So when Kennedy was assassinated, that was the first time I ever saw my father crying. My father was a very strong man. He had been to World War II, he had fought in the Philippines, he had fought in Okinawa, and uh, when he saw, when, he, when Kennedy was assassinated, it affected my father very deeply. And so um, when Kennedy was assassinated, I remember I was in the ninth grade, and I never will forget that uh, assassinated. I never will forget him with his wife uh, driving on that boulevard in Dallas and the shots being fired and his body slumping over. And the governor of, of, of Texas was also wounded in that. And uh, that, was, that, was, that was the first of the political assassinations, probably one of the most savage of all the political assassinations that we witnessed as a young person. 
And it was only a few years later that Medgar Evers was also assassinated as well. Medgar Evers, one of the giants of the civil rights movement. And he, he was different from Martin Luther King because he did believe in defending himself. And he was assassinated by the Ku Klux Klan. And then shortly after that, Malcolm X would be assassinated. And we had been living, black people had been living in segregation in this country since the end of slavery. You know, I grew up in segregation. You know, the people that were my peers, we grew up in segregated Chicago and segregated Seattle. In many other places, uh, we, we were not allowed to get certain jobs. We weren't allowed to go to certain schools. We weren't allowed outside of our communities. <clears throat> And in many ways it was good, segregation was good because it, it forced us to rely on ourselves. It, it allowed us to continue with our cultural value system, you know, to raise our kids and have our own businesses in the community, our own pharmacists, our own uh, drug stores, our own gas stations, and, it, and, and, and our cultural value system of, of protecting all the kids in the community and having our little league programs and. It, it, in many ways, it was, it, was, it was a very beautiful time when I grew up in Seattle under segregation, when I was in Chicago under segregation, because we just relied upon ourselves. But we weren't able to economically move forward. And so, uh, and so that's a lot of what the Civil Rights Movement was about. And so um, Malcolm X became a very important figure at that time. He had started out in the Nation of Islam. His father was killed uh, by the Ku Klux Klan, by the Jim Crow laws. And uh, that, you know, that's another part of our history that is not talked about enough is what happened after slavery. The whole Jim Crow era, you know, that was uh, designed to keep slavery continued. You know, and they had a reign of terror, of lynchings that took place in this country from the 1880s all the way to 1951, where black people were, were, were lynched all over the country. Even in New York, black people were lynched. And a Jewish man made a song about it called Strange Fruit. And Billie Holiday was one of the few artists that had the courage to sing this song about the strange fruit hanging from the popular street, trees. And that strange fruit was black people. They even made a book about this. A lot of people don't realize the word picnic came from the term pick a nigger. Because what they would do is when they decided they were gonna hang a black person, you know, all the white people in the South, they would get together and they would bring their lunch and they would have a, 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 a party while they were hanging and tar and feathering this black person. And that's where the word pick Nick came from. Pick a nigger and let's go hang him and let's go eat and enjoy it. You know, that's the savagery of this country. You know, that's the savagery of this country that uh, led to the murder and the destruction of 50 million Native Americans. I mean, this is, this is their country. We should never forget that this land was inhabited. You know, the, the, they had cities in this country that were more inhabited than they had cities in Europe by Native, by Native Americans here in this country. And they said that this country, there weren't very many people here, there weren't very many people, blah, blah, so that's why they gave us the right to come over here and conquer and take their lands. A lot of people don't realize that in the Mexican Basin, there were 25 million Native people that lived in the Mexican Basin alone which is more people that, they li that lived in Europe. So we should never get that part of history, you know, what happened to the Native Americans. And because the DNA of the Native Americans uh, was such that when they became exposed to the disease that the Europeans brought over to this country, smallpox and other diseases, they started dying by the thousands, by the thousands. Because when the colonies came over here, what they wanted, they saw all this land, was that they were going to use Native Americans as slaves to produce the things that they wanted to produce. But when they started dying by the millions, then they turned to Africa. And they brought African slaves over here. And Africans were the ones that really 
made this country what it is today. If it wasn't for the slavery of African people, that this country would not have reached the development that it has today. But it was because of the Native Americans that perished because of this happened. So we should never get these, forget these parts of history. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a time period where there was segregation. Uh, there was a lot of racism. There was a lot of police brutality. There, there weren't black people on the police department. You know, uh, you know uh, people were killed in the black community for any reason. There was no, uh, no just due of process, of legal process, that, and there still isn't today for that, for that matter. And so um, when Malcolm X was assassinated, Malcolm X had left the nation of Islam and he had traveled to the Arab world and he began to broaden his, his, his horizon. And he began to see that this movement that he wanted to create wasn't just about black people. It was about all types of people. And so he was in the process of building this organization before he was assassinated. And so when he's assassinated, uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, who lived in Oakland, Huey Newton was a law student. Bobby Seale was a, uh, he'd been an architectural engineer. He had served in the Air Force. And they came, to, came together and created this organization called the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And when they initially started the Black Panther Party, they wanted, they were focused on the tremendous amount of police brutality that was happening in the black community. And Huey P. Newton was a law student. And he, he loved the Constitution of the United States. And he took notice that in the Constitution said, the Second Amendment, everybody has the right to bear arms. And so he said, well, we need to educate black people in the black community that they have a right to protect themselves, that they have a right to bear arms. And so one of the first things that the Black Panther Party did when they came together, and th their uniform was the style of dress that uh, a lot of people in the black community wore, you know, particularly guys who were on the street. It was a leather jacket and a beret. And they added a powder blue shirt, uh, black tie, and black pants to that uniform. And that became the uniform of the Black Panther Party. And so when they began to formulate, it was just a small group of people. And, uh, you know, Huey was a very unique person. You know, he was a person that grew up, his father was a Baptist preacher. His, uh, his, uh, he was the youngest of seven kids. He had one brother who was a, a thug, a hoodlum, whatever you want to call him. But he taught Huey how to fight. And uh, Huey was short. He always taught Huey, you got to throw the first blow. And he had another brother who was who would go on to become a college professor, who taught Huey philosophy and taught Huey how to read because Huey didn't even know how to read when he was in high school until his brother taught him. And he started reading all these books on philosophy and all these worldly books. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and he had some genius in him. Huey Newton was a genius. You know, if you go back and read some of his political writings, you will understand that he was a genius. But he wasn't only a genius, but he also became a person who was fearless. Where not, nothing, he wasn't afraid of anyone or anything. And, 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 and that's what he bought when he began to form the Black Panther Party for self-defense. One of the first things that they did was they began to go out and purchase legal weapons and, 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 and study the law. And they said, we're going to go out and patrol the police because we have a right to do that. And so the 15 to 20 members of the Black Panther Party who were around at that time, you know, they acquired rifles and shotguns and 45s, and they got cameras and tape recorders, and they went out on the streets, and they would get behind the police car, and they would follow them through the community, and every time they stopped a black person, they would get out and line up and inform the police they had a right to observe what was taking place. Now, a lot of these police officers in L.A. and in, in San Francisco and Oakland had been recruited from the Deep South, Mississippi, Louisiana, and, uh, and all of these places. And a lot of these black people had migrated from the South during World War II, from Louisiana and Texas and so forth. So, you know, the, the, the West represented something new to them. It represented a change, 
uh, represented an opportunity to kind of really be a part of America that they really had wanted it wanted to be. And so when this police brutality continued, followed them from the Deep South, then that's when the Black Panther Party came about. And so there were many confrontations between Huey Newton and the, and, and the Black Panther Party while they were out patrolling these police. I mean, if you could imagine, you know, this police officer from Louisiana or Mississippi uh, stopping a black person, then he turns around, he sees these 15 black men with these uniforms on, with rifles and shotguns, saying that we're going to observe you. And it was Huey that would stand down these, 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 these racist police officers. And they would say to Huey, uh, nigger, what are you doing with that gun? Because that's the dialogue that they use. But they didn't know who they were talking to. And Huey would say back to them, pig, what are you doing with your gun? I have a right to have my gun. And if you try to shoot me, I'm going to shoot you. And Huey would jack around into his shotgun. And he would recite the laws. He would recite the laws that gave him the right to have his rifle and his shotgun. And so it, it, there was nothing illegal there. He was not doing anything illegal. But what he was doing was he was showing a tremendous amount of strength and a tremendous amount of audacity that he backed down so many of these police officers that they decided that they had to eliminate him. And in 1967, uh, Huey, before this, Huey had been stopped over 50 times when he was not carrying his weapons with his, with his comrades. He'd been stopped over 50 times. And one particular night in 1967, he was out with a friend. They had been to a party, and the police pulled him over. And they pulled him out of the car. They took him to the back. Now, Huey had a law book that he carried around. And he had carved the inside of that law book out and put a 38 in there. So when they took him back to the back of the police car, uh, they shot him. They shot him twice in the stomach. So Huey goes in his law book, and he returns fire. And he kills one of the police officers and wounds another one. And at that point, uh, Huey is arrested and charged with murder and charged with attempted murder. And that's when the Black Panther Party begins to spread. Now, the Black Panther Party started because of, 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 um, of Malcolm X. But it was actually uh, the death of Martin Luther King that led to the spread of the Black Panther Party. Because I had been involved in the Civil Rights Movement. I met Martin Luther King. I marched with Martin Luther King when I was very young. And after I met Martin Luther King, I, I volunteered for the first integrated busing program to integrate the schools. You know, I, I took myself out of the, the school in the black community I was in, and I volunteered to bus myself across town to an all-white school. I was, there was only two black students there because I wanted to be part of this movement that Martin Luther King was a part of. I wanted to be part of creating a better world for America and integrating the schools. So I sacrificed myself, as many black students did at that time, to bust ourselves to these white schools to integrate the schools. And so I would later go on to graduate from high school and uh, uh, be uh, one of 35 students at the University of Washington and help to start the first black student union at the University of Washington. And while we were formulating the Black Student Union, we were doing work in the community. We marched on the high school there, and we closed it down because of some racist things that were taking place. And then we found ourselves arrested uh, and locked up uh, on April the 4th, 1968. You know, I'm sitting in the King County Jail with other members of the BSU, and we're wondering, you know, I've never been arrested before, even though there were times I was doing some bad things, I should have been arrested. But I had never been arrested before. And so we're all sitting in the, in the county jail. And then the Walter Conkright comes on. He announces that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And that was a very sad day. And the riots start breaking out. The news media starts showing all the riots breaking out all over America and Harlem and Chicago and, 
L.A. and everywhere. All the young people are mad and they're angry. They're out on the street because they killed a man of peace. They killed a man of love when they killed Martin Luther King. This was a man of pure love. He had no hatred in him. You know, he wanted to create a better world for people in America, and they assassinated him. And this was what? Kennedy, Medgar Evers, Malcolm. This was the fourth political assassination that we had to witness as young people, the fourth one. And I remember that night, I remember going back to my bunk, and I remember saying to myself that my picket sign was going to be replaced by a gun. And I didn't realize that all across the country, young people were saying the same thing. White kids, black kids, brown kids, yellow kids, red kids. Because we all grew up watching Martin Luther King. And when they killed Martin Luther King, they killed the Civil Rights Movement. And so from after I got out, I joined the Black Panther Party, and the Black Panther Party spread all across the country. And the Seattle chapter was the first chapter outside of the state of California. And so the Black Panther Party in its early inception was made up of mostly men, uh, rough men who had been ex-pimps, ex-hustlers. But as the Black Panther Party began to spread and grow, it'd be a lot of college students became and joined the Black Panther Party. And the, what separated, there were a lot of militant organizations at that time, but what separated the Black Panther Party from those other black nationalists, mostly organizations, was that we recognized, because Huey and Bobby were so well read, that we recognized that this struggle that we were creating was not just about black people. It was about all people. It was about anybody who was oppressed. You know, it was about, <clears throat> anybody who was demonized by this society. And so the Black Panther Party, in its early inception, we understood the importance of broad coalition building. One of the first coalitions that the Black Panther Party developed was with the Peace and Freedom Party, which was a white organization that was based here in California. And then other organizations began to pop up that was similar to the Black Panther Party, like the Brown Berets which was a Latino organization in California. And they wore brown berets, they wore brown khaki jackets, and they uh, had to put out a newspaper like the Black Panther newspaper. Uh, you had the uh, AIM, American Indian Movement. You had the Red Guard, which was mostly uh, Asian students. You had SDS. Uh, you had the uh, a Seattle Liberation Front, which was white students. You also had the Vietnam War that a lot of white students had recognized was an unjust war. Because after Kennedy was assassinated, they began the expansion of the Vietnam War. All of a sudden, now you got thousands of young people who are being drafted, uh, taken off the streets, and sent to, into these jungles of Vietnam to fight these people that we really had no quarrel with. And I remember when I was 16 years old, I was, I was very patriotic. I remember I told my father that I was going to uh, join the Marines and go to Vietnam. And my father looked at me, and he was extremely angry. He said, ain't no son of mine going to Vietnam, because I had two other brothers. He said, those people over there did not call you a nigger. And so I'm not going to allow you to go to Vietnam. And so I thank my father for, for saving me. Uh, but it, I, I, you know, by that time, by the time I was 18, I got my draft papers, and I was also already a member of the Black Panther Party. And I remember I went down to the induction center, and I had my field jacket on and my black beret, and I took my draft card and tore it up, and threw it in the face of the sergeant, told him I wasn't going to no MF in Vietnam. <clears throat> so, uh, so as the Black Panther Party began to spread, as we began to build all these coalitions and this movement was being created in America. And then I just remember that time period, even before that, I just remember this, it was always on the lips of everybody, the movement, the movement. And everybody had the sense of movement. And everybody had the sense that they were participating on some level or another 
in this movement. It, it was really beautiful. It was really beautiful the way to see people came together and, and walking down the street and, and people saying, you know, hey brother, hey sister, how you doing? And give you the power sign and people always being so friendly to you and, 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 and the feeling of unity that we had. And, and uh, it, was, it was a very beautiful time. Um, and so as the Black Panther Party began to spread across the country and all these young people uh, from college campuses that became to get involved in the Black Panther Party because we had a newspaper that was started at the very formation of the Black Panther Party. It's called the Black Panther Intercommunal News Service. And because uh, the party, the leadership of the party knew the importance of having a newspaper. They knew imp the importance of having your own voice to be able to define the phenomena that was taking place around us. And that's what the Black Panther paper allowed us to do. It, be, it allowed us to not only to tell the story about what the Black Panther Party was really about, because the media was constantly de de dehumanizing us and saying we're a bunch of thugs, a bunch of hoolins, and we're doing this and we're doing that. But we wanted to be able to tell what, what was really happening, not only with the Black Panther Party, but what was really happening with the government, what was really happening in America, what was really happening around the world, because we had an international section in the Black Panther Party. We talked about all the different movements and all the things that were going on worldwide. We also had a, a, a part of the newspaper that was printed in Spanish, you know, because we understood the importance of having a strong coalition with the Latino community, because Cesar Chavez was creating uh, a, a tremendous, powerful movement in, 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 the, uh, in the United Farm Workers. And, uh, and, and so this, this was a very much a part of the movement that was taking place uh, throughout the rest of the country. And we had a very strong relationship with Cesar Chavez. And so uh, at, at, in 1968, Diego Hoover, Attorney General John Mitchell, Richard Nixon, they declare that the Black Panther Party, they called the press conference, the Black Panther Party was the number one threat to the security of America. You know, I never will forget that. But we did not know that they had a secret plan called Cointel Pro, where they were going to wipe out the Black Panther Party. Actually, they had said amongst themselves that they were going to kill us off by 1969. We had no idea. We had no idea what was facing us. We just knew that we were young people, we were, uh, we were dedicated, and that we wanted to create a better world for everybody. And so we joined organizations like the Black Panther Party and many of these other organizations. So our newspaper, we, we used to say power is the ability to define phenomena and make it act in a desired manner. Now today, all the media is, cor is, is controlled by the corporate media. They define to us what the phenomena is and that keeps us confused because they tell us lies. They tell us half-truths. And so we don't hardly know anything. We think we know something. We don't know anything. And we're looking at CNN every day. Fox, matter of fact, sometimes you get better news from Fox News. But the main media, you are, we, are, we are so deluded with so many lies. But this is why we, are, we in the Black Panther Party, we had our newspaper. Because we had to be able to define what was going on. And so... Um, in the early inception where there were many chapters, and there were some chapters and branches that never fully got off the ground because they were heavily infiltrated by the Black Panther Party. The Baltimore chapter, the New, New Jersey chapter, the Omaha, Nebraska chapter. There were two young brothers who started the Omaha, Nebraska chapter. They got infiltrated, a bomb went off, somebody died, and they got charged with murder. And they've been in prison to this very day for 45 years even though witnesses have come forth and said that they were not part of this. In the Baltimore chapter, just most recently, the person who was head of the Baltimore chapter just got out of prison after 43 years because he had been charged with uh, murdering a police officer. And even though there was a lot of evidence to show that he had nothing to do with this murder, but they framed him and they were able to keep him in prison for all those years. And we, to this very day, we have 20 political prisoners who are in prison today who are members of the Black Panther Party. <coughs> so they began this tremendous assault. So the other important thing about the Black Panther Party is 
we were well read. We were, when we first joined the Black Panther Army, when Bobby Seale so first came to Seattle, one of the first things he said is that you gotta have 2,000 rounds of ammunition, you gotta have two guns. And the next thing that George Murray, the Minister of Education, who was a professor at San Francisco State College, he said, he gave us a book list of 25 books, and said, as a Panther, you gotta read two hours a day, and you have to read all the books on this book list, and you have to have political education class twice a week. And that's what we were told. So we were a very well-educated organization. And because of that, and because Huey was a philosopher, we were taught that nothing stands outside of change. So we were always changing as an organization. So by 1969, we stopped wearing our uniform. We got ordered to take our uniforms off, because they're separating us from the community. And we also <clears throat> had to put our guns away because uh, we had this brief period of time where we were able to exercise our right to carry weapons, particularly in Oakland and in Seattle. And what they did in the state of California, what they did in the state of Washington, they passed legislation that made it illegal to carry guns out in the open. So we had to put those guns away. Then we turned our attention on, because on, on, we really, the, truthfully, we were revolutionaries. We wanted to create revolutionary change in this country. We wanted to turn things upside down so that the people were at the bottom were now at the top. The people who were at the top would now be at the bottom. And the people would be in control. And we would have schools, education for everybody. We would, we would be able to provide nutrition for everybody. And so but we, the people were not ready for this type of revolution, even though revolutionary movements were breaking out all over the world. You know, all through South America, they had revolutionary movements. Brazil, Argentina, Chile, all those countries. In Africa, you had revolutionary movements. We looked at the Vietnamese movement as a revolutionary movement. So it was very natural for us to want to be part of this worldwide revolution. And so, um, and so uh, because of the Vietnam War was taking place, uh, there was a lot of poverty in the community. There were, there were, the resources that could have gone in the community were now going towards the Vietnam War, just like what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, all these billions of dollars being spent for these wars. And that, that money could be used right here in this country. We had the same uh, dynamics taking place. So we, we said, okay, we gotta start some program. We gotta serve the people. So one of the first programs we started was a free breakfast for school children program. We said, how is little Jimmy gonna learn that five apples and four apples and nine apples? He ain't even had an apple before he went to school. <laughs> so we went to some uh, churches, we went to communities near elementary schools. We asked them if we can use their facilities. They said, yeah. So pretty soon we got donations from uh, all outside of the community, inside of the community. Pretty soon we're feeding thousands of kids breakfast every day on the way to school. You know, Chicago chapter is feeding 1,000 kids. New York chapter, L.A. chapter feeding 1,000 kids. Seattle, we're feeding like 850 kids a day. Free nutritional breakfast to kids on their way to school. Then we said, hey, you know, there's no medical clinic. People don't have no medical care. What are we going to do about that? So they gave us orders. They sent a memo random to all the chapters and branches. You got orders to open up a free medical clinic. In 1969, we opened up a free, the first free medical clinic in the Northwest in Seattle. The Black Panther Party would go on to open up 11 free medical clinics all across the country. And two of those medical clinics are still open to the, to, today. And in, in some chapters and branches, they started an ambulance program because there was always a running joke in the ghetto, ambulance is gonna, isn't going to come to the ghetto. So in Harlem, North Carolina, they opened up a free ambulance program. Then we started to open up a free food program. We started giving out bags of groceries out of our community office once a week. And we started a free legal aid program. There were a lot of young attorneys who were willing to donate their time. We got a lot of these attorneys to donate their time. And we opened up a free legal aid program where people could come to our community centers and they could get legal advice. We started a free busing for prisons program because we recognized how's Mrs. Jones going to get out to this prison five hours away and she didn't even have any money to get out there. So we started these busing, free busing to prison programs all across the country. We went on to start over 30 different programs. And we did this without any government funding. We had orders that no Panther chapter branch could take any government funding. And this was all hard work. This was hard work. So by this time, 1969, if you were a member of the Black Panther Party, you were working all the time. You worked from, from you know, you had to do security from 10 to 6, 
in two hour shifts. And then after that, you had to go out to the breakfast program, you had to go feed the kids. And there are many people who were in the Black Panther Party who didn't see feeding hungry kids as being revolutionary, and they left the organization. But we knew we were right, we knew they were wrong. And so then you had to work in the uh, medical clinic. If you were coordinating the medical clinic, you coordinated the liberation school. Then you had to go out and sell 100 papers every day because we said the voice of the party is the voice of the people. And that paper was very important. And at the, at, at the high point of the Black Panther Party, we had a circulation of 350,000 worldwide, our newspaper. We had the finest alternative newspaper in the world in the world. We sent these papers all over the world. And, um, <coughs> and they tried to stop the newspaper from coming out. The FBI, sometimes the papers would be burned. We'd go to the airport, they would be burned, they would be wet, they would be soaking, they would be disappeared, they wouldn't be. So we had to devise methods to get around that. You know, we had Panthers from Chicago and New York fly in, they'd pick up a copy, a print of the newspaper, and they'd go back to Chicago and New York and print it there, and we distributed it there. So we were always, we always had to stay one step ahead of what they were trying to do to us. So uh, in January 17th of, of, of uh, 1969, the Southern California chapter started by Bunchy Carter and John Huggins were on the campus of UCLA. A lot of people don't realize there was a Black Panther Party that led to the formation of the Black Studies Program. It actually started at San Francisco State where many Black Panther Party members were students and uh, the, the Minister of Education at that time, George Murray, was a professor there. They started the first Black Studies Program at San Francisco State and that began to spread. It spread to LA and L.A. and uh, Bunchy Carter played an important role. Bunchy Carter, who came out of San Quentin Prison, was head of the largest gang in L.A. called the Slossons. And uh, he left the Slossons and joined the party. Many of, the, uh, of those members of the Slossons followed him into the Black Panther Party. And in 1969, January 17, he was assassinated along with John Huggins on the campus of UCLA campus. <laughs> and of course, that was all orchestrated by the FBI and the police. It created tension between the US organization and it led to that assassination. It was very devastating for the Southern California chapter. Now, in Chicago, this young man named Fred Hampton, who was a member of the NAACP, marched with Martin Luther King, and uh, heard about the Black Panther Party, joined the Black Panther Party. He used to study the speeches of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, all rolled into one. And he used to practice in the mirror, you know, giving these speeches. And when he went to church, the pastor would ask him to come up and say something. And, and pretty soon, you had Malcolm X and Martin Luther King coming out of his mouth. And so he started the first chapter of the Black Panther Party in Chicago at 19 years old. One of the first things he does, he goes out to the two largest gang. I'm from Chicago. I remember, I remember, you know, driving through the south side of Chicago and on the walls, everywhere you look, Blackstone Rangers, Blackstone Rangers, you know, the Black Gangster Disciples. And the first thing he does is he get, gets, meets with the leaders of these two gangs and tells them they gotta stop fighting each other. And he, he gets one of the gangs to join up with the Black Panther Party. He also meets Cha-Cha Jimenez, who was head of the Puerto Rican gang called the Young Lords. He convinces Cha-Cha to change his organization, to, uh, to his gang to a political organization. Then he goes down to the north side of Chicago where the poor whites have migrated from the Appalachian. And he starts meeting with their organizers. And he forms the first rainbow coalition, with black, brown, and, 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 and uh, and white. That's the Rainbow Coalition. And so now Fred Hampton, because he forms this coalition, it becomes a tremendous threat to the Mayor Daley machine, because the Mayor Daley had been mayor for 34 years. He's a little, little emperor, and he controlled all the, uh, the, 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 the politics in Chicago. And so when this happens, he becomes slated for assassination. And so uh, December Third, Fred Hampton is meeting with the staff in his house because uh, we had to meet a lot because we were doing so many things. We couldn't do things half as Bobby Seal was an organizational genius and he wanted things to be laid out perfectly. Everything had to be well planned, well organized because we had breakfast programs, feeding programs, all these things. The newspapers had to be sold. And so Fred Hampton is meeting with his staff late at night up until late in the evening. 
he did not know that his security head was the FBI informant. And not only he had given the layout to Fred Hampton's house to the FBI, but he also had put some second on Fred Hampton's drink. <coughs> and so um, at four in the morning on December 4th, there's a knock on the door. Uh, Mark Clark, captain of the Peoria chapter, goes to the door with a shotgun in his hand and says, who is it? Shots go through the door and kill him instantly. Simultaneously, the ATF, Chicago Police Department, FBI, burst through the rear door. They go into the house, the bullets are blazing, and they, they shoot about five Panthers. They shoot the head of the medical clinic in Chicago. They shoot him in his stomach. He never fully recovers from getting those shots. They go into Fred Hampton's uh, bedroom. His wife, who is six months pregnant, she tries to wake Fred, but he's been drugged. And he won't wake up, so she lays on top of him to protect him police drag her off of him and take her out of the room and they go back into the room and shoot Fred Hampton in the head four times while he's sleep in his sleep. And that was a, a, a very sad day for all of us because Fred Hampton was going to need to be the next great leader of America. He was going to be the next Malcolm X, the next Martin Luther King, all rolled into one. And he was a human. He loved human beings. You know, Fred Hampton wasn't just about the black community. He loved human beings and he loved justice. And he was willing to fight and sacrifice for that, for that purpose. And he was assassinated in a very cold way. And the very next day, the Chicago Panthers opened up that house and they had over a thousand people that went through that house that saw the bullets had been fired from the outside in because the media says the Panthers shot first. They shot from inside out, and they showed the door where the bullets came from the outside. They showed the bloody mattress that Fred Hampton had died on, and the people were angry because they saw the truth. They saw that this was nothing but a cold-blooded political assassination, and this was part of their plan to wipe us out. Then they, four days later, they go to L.A. As the L.A. chapter had one of the most military-minded chapters, had a lot of Vietnam vets. We had been given orders to fortify our, our offices. You know, in Seattle, we had double sandbags up to the ceiling. Uh, in our office, we had uh, steel plates on the windows and on the doors. Uh, we had gas masks, uh, you know, because we wanted to protect ourselves. We wanted to defend ourselves. So the L.A. Police Department commenced this assault on the L.A. chapter on Central Avenue. They burst through the door. See, the SWAT team came about because of the Black Panther Party. And the Black Panther Party knew that when a SWAT team comes through the door, they like to go to the left. They like to go to the right. So they took all the chairs and all the tables and laid them on both sides of the door. Because we used to get calls all the time. We're going to come get you niggers tonight. You know, somebody, sometimes we would get a call from somebody who was downtown and said, you know, they're planning a raid on you tonight. And so, so, you know, we tried to be prepared as much as we could. So the L.A. Panthers were prepared somewhat, you know. And, and, and on this particular night, December 8th, they burst through the door. The SWAT team burst through the door, and the Panthers returned fire and blew them right out the door. And they had a shootout that lasted for seven to eight hours. And many Panthers were wounded in that shootout. And they ran out of ammunition. They put up the white flag. They came out with their hands up and surrendered, were arrested for attempted murder. And I don't know how you can be arrested for attempted murder for defending yourself. So, um, and then they came to Seattle. The ATF come to Seattle because the FBI sent out a memo. He wanted three chapters destroyed, Chicago, L.A., and Seattle. And he goes to Mayor West Oman. They go to Mayor West Oman. Where West Oman is a, is, a, is a liberal mayor. He saw what happened in Chicago. He saw what happened in L.A. He decided he was not going to allow that to happen in Seattle because we were so well entrenched in Seattle. We were a much smaller city. We had, you know, five breakfast program locations. We had free food programs. We had the medical clinics. And so he knew that he could not have this bloodshed on his hand. And so he told the FBI, the ATF, I'm not going to give you support from the Seattle Police Department to go in and raid and kill these young men. And that kind of really set a precedence for other cities around the country to stand up against the ATF and, and the FBI. But those assassinations, the assassination of Bunchy Carter, there were over 25, 30 members of the Black Panther Party that would be killed 
by 1971, and um, it had a tremendous effect on the Black Panther Party. But even then, we weren't, we weren't through. By 1972, we consolidated all of our forces. We decided we were going to make Oakland a liberated territory. We began to run Bobby Steele for mayor and Elaine Brown for city council. Around that same time, Shirley Chisholm, the first, the first black congresswoman, decides she's going to run for president. And the, the Black Panther Party was the first and only black organization that really supported her. A lot of the black congressmen didn't want to support her. He said, who is this woman? that's going to jump out there and say she wants to run for president. But we understood the significance of it. So we supported her. And then we ran our own campaign. We ran Bobby Steele for mayor and Lane Brown for city council. And to kick off that campaign, we gave away 10,000 bags of groceries. I remember the Oakland Auditorium. First of all, before we had the rally at the Oakland Auditorium, I remember the 10,000 bags of empty bags on the floor of the Oakland Auditorium and how meticulous we had to be to put a, 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 a carton of eggs, a loaf of potatoes, canned food, uh, a frozen chicken in each bag. And when we kicked the campaign off, Bobby Seale uh, uh, announced his campaign for Mary, threw his hat off into the crowd, and the curtain goes up, the auditorium was full of people, and we proceeded to give away 5,000 bags of groceries with the chicken in every bag. People at Oakland still talk about that. Excuse me. Then the next day, we gave out another 5,000 bags in East Oakland. And we also tested uh, 3,000 kids for sickle cell anemia. Because uh, sickle cell anemia was a disease that a lot of black people didn't know about. But it was a disease that primarily affected black people. And so the first thing we did was, in our newspaper, we did an expose about sickle cell anemia. And then we went out and tested thousands of people all across the country. Now that is the true the definition of power is the ability to define phenomena and make it act in the desired manner. That we were able to define the phenomena, not only were we able to define it, we were all able to take the power within ourselves to find the solutions to the problems, whatever the problem was that was in our community. And that was the power of the Black Panther Party. And by 1972, I remember being in Oakland. Cocaine was a casual drug uh, at that time. Everybody was snorting cocaine if you had the money. Hollywood actors, politicians. Huey had been a, introduced to cocaine when he got out of Cal when he got out of prison in 1972, and it began to affect his judgment of things. And there was so much of it around. I just remember it was just so much of it. We didn't know. We thought the Italians, the mafia, was bringing in the cocaine. But it was the Nicaraguan drug dealers who were bringing it in to Northern California. It was the same Nicaraguan drug dealers who bought that crack cocaine into the country in the 80s. And so it affected Huey's judgment. He, Huey got to the point where he no longer could be this superhero that he had been elevated to. And he just wanted to be just Huey Newton in the streets of Oakland. And eventually he dismantled the Black Panther Party. Uh, and the Black Panther Party ceased, ceased to exist in 1980. We all know what happened when the Black Panther Party was eliminated with the crack cocaine and the gang epidemic. Because during the whole era of the Black Panther Party gang warfare, there was no gang warfare. It had almost come to a, a halt. And when the Crips came about, the Crips were trying to emulate the Black Panther Party that are in the Crip. That meant revolutionary. And they got an award from the mayor. The mayor convinced them to take that revolutionary out. And there were no Black Panther Party members around because everybody had been killed, imprisoned, and and disillusioned from all the things that happened. There was nobody that could go to these young people and say, this is how you create a movement. This is what you need to do. You need to have an ideology. You need to have rules. You need to do this. You need to do that. There was nobody to give them that guidance. And, so it, and, and then the CIA, along with the whole Contra thing, we all know about that. It's been well publicized, well documented that the CIA bought all those drugs into L.A., it was the CIA by the truckloads, the plane loads, every conceivable way. And when they bought the, the drugs in, they were bringing guns in. 
And so this is what led to this epidemic that has devastated the black community and has affected the structure, the infrastructure of America as a whole. This crack cocaine gang epidemic where all of a sudden the, the family, the family and the community system that we had in place in the 50s and 60s was completely destroyed, completely wiped out. And this is where we're at now. This is why they're able to do the things that they do now. The corporations have completely taken over the media. There are no hardly any alternative news medias like the Black Panther newspaper. In the 60s, there are a lot of different alternative newspapers. There isn't hardly any now. And so, uh, you know, we're like the walking dead. We're like zombies, you know. Uh, you know, we, we, and, and we think that everything is, is okay. We have, we have the appearance of luxury. You know, we got Renner Center. You can go to Renner Center, you can have the thing that everybody else has, but you just gotta pay $100 a, a, a day for your big screen TV. <laughs> but you think you still got it, you know, but you really don't. You know, you can rent the rim. Renter, they got renter rims now. <laughs> so you, you got the appearance of having luxury, having access, but you really don't. You know, we don't have access to free medical care. We got 50,000 homeless people, as I said before, here. So uh, it is my hope that, that young people will begin to realize that this is a great illusion that has been played upon. This is a, you got to give them credit. They have created a tremendous illusion upon us, you know, and that it, all you got to do is work hard and pull yourselves up by the bootstrap. Yeah, individually, you can succeed individually, but it doesn't work that way for people of color and for poor people. Individualism doesn't work. In the 50s and 60s, we didn't have individualism. We had a communalism. We did things communally. You know, you could always go next door and borrow some sugar, borrow some salt, borrow some eggs. Or Mr. Jones, if your son was acting up down the street, he'd spank your son and send him home. <laughs> now, now, you better not touch my son. You know, I remember going to school, teachers had paddles like this. And if you acted up, man, bend over, bam. You know, they, had, they could straighten you out because the, the teachers and the schools were part of the community. Now we got this, oh, Yo, you better not touch my son, I'm gonna call the police and blah, blah, blah. So <clears throat> it is my hope that we will wake up because the, the, the people who are in control are mad men, mad men. They're destroying the environment, they're destroying the earth, they're invading, re-invading Indian lands to mine the coal and mine the copper and, and uranium. They want to build this pipeline. Obama said he's the pipeline president. And every day there's a damn uh, pipeline uh, exploding. There's a, there's a lake, there's a river that is being polluted. What is going to be left for our kids? Nothing. So we got to wake up. We got to wake up. We got to prepare to fight. It, doesn't, it, it can't be no violence. It's not going to be. We, we're in. We're in 99 percent anyway. We got the power. There's way more of us than there is of them. We just have to be able to come together and see that we are all in this together. So I want to thank you. All power to the people. <laughs>